Ladies and gentlemen, it's really great to see uh, big uh, numbers in this uh, match hall. Uh, if you have a friend who is uh, coming, don't text him that it's all, uh, it is not yet, and if it is, then there's an overflow room to full spot. But uh, uh, you're very warmly welcome uh, if you are a member of public, but especially welcome if you are a student. Uh, we are uh, also welcoming people who are from abroad, we have a number of international guests, and monumental welcome to our special guest, uh, Professor John Lennox. Welcome to me. We, we came to hear the lecture, Time for Science, What Can We Really Know? It is actually a first lecture of a twin uh, lectures. Uh, the other one is called Time for Truth, Who Can We Really Trust? And it will be delivered by uh, Dr. Oz Guinness on Monday at the Philosophical Faculty. And these lectures are organized by the student uh, movement, Universitní křesťanské hnutí, University Christian Association, but also uh, by philosophical faculty of Charles University. And I would like to thank the dean of the philosophical faculty of Charles University, Dr. Miriam Friedova, who gave her full support to this event. And it would be really fitting if I just quote some of her words regarding this evening. For me, as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts of Charles University, it is not only monumental privilege, but also a deep joy to invite you to listen to two amazing lectures by two amazing speakers. These themes are surrounded by a lot of prejudice and unusual interpretations. I therefore think that it is important to come back and revisit these themes and expose them to serious and well-informed debate. Our guest is the best speaker we could have today for tonight's theme. Um, Professor Lennox lectures uh, philosophy and mathematics at uh, Oxford University. Uh, he studied maths at Cambridge University, where he also attended some of the last lectures of C.S. Lewis. He also completed a degree of bioethics, and he is the author of many books, including um, Has Science Buried God? Seven Days That Divide the World, or God and Stephen Hawking. He debated top leading atheists, including Richard Dawkins. One of the books you can uh, buy here, actually, at a discounted price uh, on my left after the talk. And uh, he's a skillful linguist. He speaks uh, Russian and German. He gives lectures in German. He is also quite familiar with French and Spanish. And uh, he translated some uh, Russian uh, books regarding mathematics. So, before I invite him to speak, I would like to ask you to switch off your phone if you haven't done that already. Uh, I would also kindly ask you not to use flash when you take photographs. And, um, and I would like to um, uh, invite you to listen to our guests. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to ask our guest speaker, Jonas, to uh, tell us his. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for the days, but that's very limited, isn't it? And I'm embarrassed sitting here. He's just been talking about my uh, alleged linguistic abilities, and here I am in a famous Czech university, you can all speak English, and I can speak two and a half words of Czech. So that's very disappointing, but let me tell you, I am massively impressed 
by the way in which students today in Europe have mastered the English language. I'm sorry I can't speak in Czech, but I haven't got the time to learn it before I give my next sentence. The topic tonight is time for science. What can we know? I've always been interested in knowledge. I grew up in a small country off the coast of Western Europe. It's called Northern Ireland. You've probably never heard of it. And it is a country with a sad reputation for sectarian violence. So I grew up as a boy when that violence was only just beginning. Allegedly religious tension, but more complex than that. But it's important that you know a little bit about my origins because to a large extent they determine my major interests. My parents were Christian, but they were not sectarian, which was very unusual. My father demonstrated that in that in the store that he ran, he tried to employ equally across the Protestant-Catholic divide. That was not usual. The result of that was bombing. And in one of the bombings, my brother nearly lost his life. So sectarian violence came very close to our family. The second thing about my parents that I value so much is that in a country that was, I'm afraid, famous for narrow-mindedness in many directions. They allowed me to think, and they interested me very early on in alternative worldviews. I can recall I was about 14, and my father gave me a book. I said, Dad, what is that? But he was not an educated man, although he would have loved to have been. He said, it's the Communist Manifesto. Oh, I said, really? Why should I read that? He said, because you need to know what other people think. And that was a very important introduction for me to the topic that occupies a lot of my time, and that is worldview. The fundamental presuppositions against what we think, and of course, regarding our attitude to what we can know. So let's dive straight into the topic as rapidly as we can, if this thing would work. And it's working up there, but it's not working here, unfortunately. So let's try again. Are we right now? The philosopher Immanuel Kant had three famous questions. What can I know? What can I hope for? And what must I do? And to the first of those questions, Franz Kafka gave a wonderful answer. All knowledge, the totality of all questions, and all answers is contained in the dog. If one could but realize the knowledge, if one could but bring it into the light of day, if we dogs would but own that we know infinitely more than we admit to ourselves. And I think there's a strong element of truth in that. We know more, as Michael Polanyi put it, we know more than we can tell. We know so many different things. The existence of material objects. We know intangible truths, like three times three equals nine, the laws of logic, and that other people have minds as we ourselves have. We know historical things, such as that Caesar Augustus was emperor in Rome. And we instinctively know some moral truths, such as it is wrong to torture infants. 
And we know from experience that not everybody is honest and tells the truth. And we even know hypothetical things, such as what would happen if we were to drive a car at 100 kilometers an hour into the river just outside. But we also know that the senses deceive us, as Descartes uh, pointed out. The senses deceive from time to time, and it is prudent never to trust wholly those who have deceived us even once. We know that the world is... <coughs> So that there are limitations to our sense perception. Some easy examples will help. For centuries, the vast majority of people believed that the earth was stationary and the sun went round the earth. As far as their sense perceptions were concerned, no one felt that the earth was moving. And yet, it turns out that it is. And so develops the very important branch of philosophy that we call epistemology, coming from the Greek words episteme and logos, the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, its validity and scope. And there are key questions to be answered. To what extent can we distinguish between justified belief and opinion and gain knowledge of the world? But what is very important to realize that epistemology is what is called a second order discipline. That is, we do not need to know the solution to many of the complex problems of knowledge in order to know something. It is amazing what some of my grandchildren at the age of four already know, and not one of them has even learned the word epistemology. There is a great deal that we can get to know. And the Moravian-born philosopher Edmund Husserl said, and it's a very important statement for scientists actually, the right attitude to take is the pre-philosophical and in a good sense dogmatic sphere of inquiry to which all empirical sciences, but not these alone, belong is in full consciousness to discard all skepticism together with all natural philosophy and theory of knowledge and find the data of knowledge where they actually face you. Whatever difficulties epistemological reflection may subsequently raise concerning the possibility of such data being there. And that was one of the brilliant achievements of Johannes Kepler in this very city, where he decided to abandon philosophical presuppositions of Aristotle that perfect notion, motion was circular and have a look at the actual data. And as you know, he came up with his brilliant solution to the motion of the planets around the sun in equally perfect ellipses. Now, my title is Time for Science, so what is science? It, of course, the word comes uh, from Latin, from scire, to know. And so science defines, usually, any area of systemized knowledge. That's carried across in the German word Wissenschaft. In English, we tend to reserve it for the natural sciences, that is, those branches of study related to the material of the universe and its laws, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. And scientists are, of course, the people who work in these areas. But we tend to, rather dangerously sometimes, use a shorthand, science says, where we really mean scientists say. And then, of course, there is the very important question of scientific method. It is a very difficult question. It used to be thought that scientists were completely impartial, they were completely objective, and their conclusions were permanently and utterly and completely valid. We now know, of course, that that is no longer true. So we speak much more modestly 
about ideas associated with scientific work, observation, experimentation, reasoning, but also hunches. Then induction, that is the study of repeatable phenomena, such as Kepler did in this university. And also abduction, the study of unrepeatable phenomena, like the origin of life, for example, where we cannot reproduce it in the laboratory, so we have to make an inference to the best explanation. We're most familiar with that process in forensic science. If my dead body is lying on the floor with a knife sticking in it, and Inspector Morse or Sherlock Holmes comes, he doesn't say, well, let's rerun that again to see what actually happened. Because they cannot rerun it. It's not repeatable. But you have to then make inferences. If A happened, then B would happen, and so Lennox would be dead, and so on. And you choose the best explanation. That is an increasingly important part of the natural sciences. I'm passionate about science. And its success is obvious, both on the theoretical and the practical side. On the theoretical side, our understanding of the universe, from its fundamental mathematical and physical laws to the structure of stars, earth, and life. It has been a spectacular journey, especially from the time, 1700, when Johannes Kepler was the imperial mathematician in Prague. And that has led to great spin-offs, the marvels of technology from computers to the internet. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Mission Control Center in Houston, and I was taken into this marvelous laboratory and given a pair of very expensive stereoscopic glasses and a pair of magic electronic gloves. And as I put this on, I discovered myself outside the space station looking down on Earth, and I could grab the handrail with my glove and then move to the other hand, and in that way I could walk around the space station in exactly the same way as a person who did a space walk. It was utterly spectacular. That is what technology has given to us, from smartphones to spacecraft, antibiotics, to transplant surgery. So there's no question of the value of science and technology. But then, looking at the question of what we can know, and we feel as a result of this we know a great deal, we need to investigate the assumptions that lie behind science. And one of the most obvious ones is the one that's rarely mentioned. You cannot do science without the belief let me stress that word. Some people think that only religious people have faith and belief. That is not true. Everybody has beliefs. And scientists have very special beliefs. They believe they have faith that science can be done. They also believe in the uniformity, some in the absolute uniformity of nature. That is, if I do an experiment today and you do it tomorrow, you'll get the same result. And probing further, it all depends on believing the rational intelligibility of nature. And indeed, coming back to my own special field, the mathematical intelligibility of nature. So those are the assumptions, but we're going to probe even further because we use these assumptions as a background to doing science but even behind them, there are worldview starting points. I was taught quantum physics at Cambridge by John Polkinghorne. And he wrote once, if we are to understand the nature of reality, we have only two possible starting points. Either the brute fact of the physical world, or the brute fact of a divine will and purpose behind that physical world. And you will see, if you study the history of science, and if you look at the academy, for example, in my own University of Oxford, you will see leading scientists, and other intellectuals, of course, with 
the different starting points. So let's look at the materialistic starting point. Richard Lewinton, a world famous geneticist at Harvard, says very honestly, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because, now notice this, we have a prior commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That's massively honest, and I respect it. He's saying, look, science does not force me into a materialistic worldview, but a materialistic worldview forces me to only accept certain results as scientific. Now, this is a very popular view. Here's a philosopher, Massimo Pigliucci, putting it his way. The basic assumption of science is that the world can be explained entirely in physical terms without recourse to godlike entities. Notice he says the basic assumption of science, not the basic assumption of my materialistic philosophy, but this is not a basic assumption of science. It's his basic assumption for his science. So it reduces everything to physical terms. That is, we call it physicalism. And it has consequences for our understanding of who we are. Francis Crick, Nobel Prize winner. You, he says, your joys, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. So now it's the human personal experience is reducible to biology and thence to physics. This is physicalism. Now along with it often goes a view that we call scientism. I prefer to call it scientific fundamentalism because that shocks people a little bit more. And that is the idea that science is the only way to truth. Peter Atkins, whom I've debated, and you can see it on YouTube, dueling professors, the, the debate is called, there is no reason to expect that science cannot deal with any aspect of existence. Reductionist science is omnicompetent. And then he honestly says, I long for immortality but I know that my only hope of achieving it is through science and medicine, not through sentiment and its subsets, art and theology. So this is scientism. And Alex Rosenberg, with whom I had a debate, a very interesting debate at Princeton, he says being scientistic just means treating science as our exclusive guide to reality, to nature, both our own nature and everything else. He's answering my title question. What can we know only what science tells us? Bertrand Russell put that idea, although he didn't hold this strictly. What science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Now, Russell was a very impressive philosopher and mathematician, but unfortunately, his logic disappeared when he made that statement. Because you see, that statement is not a statement of science. So if it's true, it's false. Have you got that or is it too late in the evening for logic? Scientism is logically incoherent. The statement science is the only way to knowledge is not a statement of science. Therefore, if it is true, it is false. Now another corollary of scientism is a very dangerous one. And that is that science is coextensive with rationality. Well, if that were true, this faculty would have to close tomorrow because this is a law faculty, not a natural sciences faculty. And there it is. 
uh, prava, yeah, law is. I don't know what it is, but it is. You'd have to close history faculties, linguistics faculties, and all the rest. It's very important, ladies and gentlemen, to realize that scientism doesn't work. It's logically incoherent. But more than that, it can be seen to be false. Let's now move to the other side. This is Sir Peter Medawar, Nobel Prize winner. That there is indeed a limit upon science is made very likely by the existence of questions that science cannot answer. And that no conceivable advance of science would empower it to answer. These are the questions that children ask, the ultimate questions of Karl Popper. How did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? And then he says, it is not to science. Therefore, it is not to science, therefore, but to metaphysics, imaginative literature, or religion that we must turn for answers to questions having to do with first and last things. The most important questions we ask actually are not answered by natural science. Now let me unpack that briefly by talking about what I believe is one of the most important issues in what is often called the God science debate. And that is that explanation comes at different levels. Why is the water boiling? It's boiling because the heat from the flame is heating up the glass vessel in which the water is contained. The heat is being conducted through its base and is agitating the molecules of water. That's why it's boiling. Well, actually, it's boiling because I'm hoping to have a cup of tea. Now. You smile at that because it's a silly statement. But the importance of that cannot be overestimated. There is a scientific explanation in terms of heat and its conduction and transmission. But there's another kind of explanation in terms of personal agency, volition, and desire. I want a cup of tea. And both of these explanations are necessary. One is not complete without the other. The scientific one is complete so far as natural science is concerned, but not as far as the whole picture is concerned. Please notice these explanations do not conflict or compete. And actually, People have been drinking tea for thousands of years before they knew anything about heat conduction. The personal explanation is often more important than the scientific. Now let me raise that up a level. Because there are leading scientists, notably Stephen Hawking, the physicist in the wheelchair, genius who say to people, you need to choose between God or science. Now, that's a subject in itself. The only point I want to make about it is that by thinking about my water boiling analogy and now putting it in another context, let me say this. Newton's law of gravitation no more competes with God as an explanation of the universe than the law of internal combustion competes with Henry Ford as an explanation of the motor car. They are different kinds of explanation. And the difficulty with scientism is that once the statement is made, science explains, people think they've got a complete explanation. That is almost never the case. And it was Wittgenstein who saw it most clearly. The great delusion of modernity, he wrote is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe. They describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. And I remember the day that I learned that the law of gravitation does not explain gravity. Newton realized that. Non fingo hypothesi. I'm not pretending to give you an explanation of gravity. What he got 
was a brilliant mathematical law that you could use to put people on the moon even. But that doesn't take you any nearer knowing what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is even today. So the words science explains have to be used with extreme caution. Now we've said a bit about what happens when you start with materialistic philosophy. What happens when you start with God? Now you may never have heard of E.T.S. Walton, but you see he's our only Irish Nobel Prize winner for science. So I introduce him to you, ladies and gentlemen. He worked with Rutherford and they split the atom in Cambridge, so he's moderately famous. Walton was a Christian believer and he wrote this. One way to learn the mind of the creator is to study his creation. We must pay God the compliment of studying his work of art, and this should apply to all realms of human thought. A refusal to use our intelligence honestly is an act of contempt for him who gave us that intelligence. So here's the exact opposite starting point. So we've had a Nobel Prize winner who started with materialism. His name, Francis Crick. We have a Nobel Prize winner who starts with God, his name E.T.S. Walton. So where's the conflict? Is it between science and theology? Obviously not, because both of these people won the highest physics prize there is, the Nobel Prize. And let me make it very clear that the issue in the debate is not science versus God at all. It's a clash of worldviews, theism on the one side, belief in God, and materialism or naturalism on the other. And there are brilliant scientists on both sides. The science doesn't decide it. And as we've seen, some of them confess to the fact that their worldview is a priori. That's what they start with. So we have basically two worldviews. And the profound difference between them is that in the materialistic worldview, matter is primary, mass energy if you like, and mind is derivative. With Christian theism, mind is primary, and matter is derivative. Now, let's come back to our question. What can we know? How can we know which of either of these worldviews is true? Can science, that is natural science, even help us answer questions that are beyond its reach? Einstein, one of the most brilliant scientists who's ever lived, said something very interesting about the motivation behind science. Science can only be created, he wrote, by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration towards truth and understanding. This source of feelings, notice this from Einstein, springs from the sphere of religion. Now he wasn't a theist in the commonly accepted sense, but he says to this there also belongs, notice the word faith, the faith of a scientist in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational, that is comprehensible to reason. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without that profound faith. The situation may be expressed by an image. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Now, what I want to move on to is and I'm thinking of Kepler, as you'll see in a moment, the connection between the rise of modern science and biblical theism. Again, on the theme, starting with creation, starting with God. We've looked at starting with materialism, but now as we move into the 16th and 17th centuries, we observe the simple fact that the major pioneers of modern science were all believers in God. Galileo. And then, of course, Johannes Kepler. And you'll not be surprised that I love this quote as a mathematician. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world 
should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Just so. Kepler started with a creator. So did Newton. It seems probable to me that God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. Don't doubt the creator because it is inconceivable that accidents alone could be the controller of this universe. And then there was James Clark Maxwell, and still on the door of the most famous laboratory in the world, the Cavendish at Cambridge, are inscribed the words, great are the works of the Lord to be studied by all who take delight in them. You see, none of these men had any sense of conflict between a prior faith in God and a devotion to the scientific enterprise. C.S. Lewis summed it up brilliantly. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. That is, far from faith in God hindering the rise of science, it was faith in God that was the motor that drove it. How odd that in so many parts of particularly the Western Academy, we've abandoned it. What can we really know? Well, we need to do a little bit of thinking about thinking. And here was a thinker par excellence, and he saw there was a problem with the fact that mathematics works. The only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And a famous article written by Eugene Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize like Einstein did, he talks about the enormous usefulness of mathematics as something bordering on the mysterious. There is no rational explanation of it. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And John Polkinghorn has pointed out many times that physics is powerless to explain its fundamental belief in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you have to believe in that intelligibility to do any physics at all. Right, how far have we got here? In order to get to know the universe, we have to believe that it is rationally intelligible. What do we do the work with? Up in here. And sometimes I have fun with my colleagues in Oxford and I say, what do you do your science with? And they love to tell me about equipment that costs a million dollars and all this sort of I said, no. Oh, you mean my, and they're about to say my mind, when they realize that it's not politically correct to say mind. So they say, you mean my brain. And I say, all right, that will do. For me, for the moment, we'll say you do it with your brain. Tell me about your brain. The short story, please. Oh, well, my brain in the end is the result of a mindless, unguided process. I said, really? And you trust it? <laughs> said, tell me honestly. If you knew that your computer was the end result of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? I've never had the answer yes to that. So why trust an instrument that you believe is simply the result of accident and the laws of nature, although there's a big problem where they come from in an accidental universe? And they look at me sometimes, and they say, you say that because you're a Christian. I say, not at all. I say it because I've read Darwin. They say, what? Yes, I said. Darwin confessed, with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. 
That's known as Darwin's doubt. And it has led to a lot of philosophical investigation, moving more and more into mainstream. First of all, with the brilliant philosopher Alvin Plantinga, he puts it this way, if Dawkins is right, that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties. And therefore, inevitably, to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own atheism. But the biggest stir has been caused by Thomas Nagel, who is a hard atheist. What does that mean? He publicly says he does not want there to be a God. And yet he wrote a book with an explosive title. Just look at it. Mind and Cosmos. Why the neo-Darwinian view of the world is almost certainly false. And what's his reason? It's Darwin's doubt. If the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. And years before that, C.S. Lewis had seen the problem. Unless human reasoning is valid, no science can be true. If ultimate reality is not material, not to take this into account in our context is to neglect the most important fact of all. Yet, the supernatural dimension has not only been forgotten, it has been ruled out of court by many, dismissed by many. The naturalists have been engaged in thinking about nature. They have not attended to the fact that they were thinking. The moment one attends to this, it is obvious that one's own thinking cannot be merely a natural event and therefore something other than nature exists. Now, I'm going to say something quite provocative in light of that. Science and God mix very well. But science and atheism do not mix very well. Why? Because, as I've argued, atheism logically leads to doubt about the validity of the rational processes needed to do science in the first place. And secondly, which is a huge topic in itself, reductionist materialism cannot deal with mathematics and language. We live in the information age, ladies and gentlemen, and the one thing information is not, it's not material. The message on that placard up there cannot be explained or reduced to the atoms and molecules of the paper on which it has been printed. So we come round in a circle and I find these considerations, for me as a scientist, begin to make much more plausible the biblical worldview that the word is primary, information is primary, mind is primary. In the beginning was the word. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be that came to be. So where have we got? Well, we've seen that science, though powerful, is limited. There are questions it can't answer. Secondly, I've argued the capacity to do science points to a rational mind behind the universe and makes plausible, the information age makes plausible, that the worldview that holds mind as primary and matter derivative is much more convincing than the opposite. So if there is a mind behind the universe, Kant's question becomes even more interesting, doesn't it? Can we know the mind of God? Do you remember the way Stephen Hawking ended his book, The Brief History of Time, when he thought if we found a theory that encompassed all the laws of physics, we would know the mind of God. But Hawking has subsequently says he doesn't believe in God, so there is no mind of God. Well, can we know the mind of God? Well, we can know other minds. 
So let's just, as I come to an end, think of how we know other minds. Well, I suppose if we are natural scientists, we would think, first of all, of positron emission tomography as a way of getting to know other minds. So you have a PET scan. But just a moment, you don't get to know my mind, you get to know my brain. And that begins to distinguish, and it's a very interesting philosophical discussion, between the mind story and the brain story. But I tell you, don't waste your time or your money, you will never get to know me by doing MRI, PET scans, or any other scan that you can think of. You may get to know something about the correlation between my thoughts and the firing of synapses in my brain, but that's it. How would you get to know me? Well, actually, you've got to know me a little bit tonight, haven't you? How does that happen? Well, because I revealed myself to you, didn't I? I told you a bit about my parents and where I come from. I didn't tell you a lot more because that would be boring and uninteresting. But the only way that you can get to know me is if I reveal myself. Now, a lot of you in this audience are skeptics. Well, join the club, so am I. You know, whenever I meet a skeptic, people say, I'm a skeptic. Well, so am I. What are you skeptical of? Perhaps I can help you. I may be skeptical of something different. But skeptine in Greek means to check from a distance. If you want to get to know me, you'll have to give up your distance, won't you? That's how friendship is generated. You have to make a decision to give up distance and reveal. That's just ordinary person-to-person -person relationships. There's a big story behind that. And I won't have time to develop it, but the big story is the central claim of Christianity, that God, who is person, has revealed himself. Now, that's not an arbitrary and incredible idea. We know that of ourselves as persons. And the central statement we've already seen, in the beginning was the word. If that makes sense, even from a scientific perspective, then that prepares our minds for taking the next step. And it's this colossal assertion. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is at the Father's side, he's made him known. And this is eternal life, that they know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What can we know? This is the biggest knowledge of all, ladies and gentlemen. I know a few little things about mathematics and some things about German and some things about history and philosophy. And those are wonderful. Exploring God's world is one thing and getting to know it. Getting to know God is an infinitely greater thing. Now, let me emphasize that just as science should be evidence-based, so is the Christian faith. It is not an irrational, existential leap into the dark by committing intellectual suicide. John, in his biography of Jesus, says at the end what his purpose is in writing. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe. Here is the evidence on which solid faith can be founded, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now that's internal evidence. But there is external evidence, a great deal of it. Let's listen to an agnostic, but an ancient historian, world famous for his work. There are no substantial doubts about the general course of Jesus' life, when and where he lived approximately when and where he died and the sort of thing that he did during his public activity. 
Bertrand Russell has had such a negative influence by stating long ago that there was no evidence that Jesus ever existed. That is denied by the vast majority of ancient historians. How do I know? Because I've read them. And that all leads me to Václav Havel. Am I right, he wrote, or mistaken, that thinking that the crisis of much needed global responsibility is in principle due to the fact that we have lost the certainty that the universe, nature, existence, and our lives are a work of creation guided by a definite intention, that they have a definite meaning and follow a definite purpose. And together with this certainty, humility towards what reaches beyond us and surrounds us. I have benefited greatly from reading Havel's letters particularly, but I think he hits the exact point here. And looking back over history, there's something that connects our cities. My city of Oxford, your city of Prague. John Wycliffe, long before the Reformation, which people have celebrated earlier this week. John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English and wrote Holy Scriptures, the highest authority for every believer, the standard of faith and the foundation for reform. And he influenced Jan Hus, and I love these words of Hus, echoing again long before the Reformation of Luther, seek the truth, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, Abide by the truth and defend the truth even unto death. What truth was it? These were men who in England and in this part of the world made sure there were reliable translations of the most influential book in history. To which Kafka's words apply. We started with him, so we'll finish with him. If the book we are reading does not wake us as with a fist hammering on our skulls, then why do we read it? A book must be the axe for the frozen sea inside us. I like to make use of what? I know. And I would encourage you to do exactly the same. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Before we go into Q&A, let me remind you that this is only the hors d'oeuvre at the beginning of the meal. The main course will be served on Monday evening when my friend and colleague, Dr. Oz Guinness, will be here to talk to you about matters of truth. Who can we really trust? And we've got to precisely that point, which is why I finished where I did. And this leaves us uh, with the next uh, approximately 30 minutes, uh, which we can devote to your questions. The way we will deal with the question time is uh, through a text message. Some of you have already sent some questions, so we will uh, start with one of these. You are a very calm man and respectful man. 
uh, even when someone attacks your beliefs and tries to make you look like a fool, you never lose your cool or get offended. I wanted to ask you if you were always this calm and peaceful or if it came with age and personality changes. Oh, it's due to a serious personality deficiency. <laughs> it's a very deliberate attitude. Not that I pretend to be calm. I am calm. Now, why is that? It's because, ladies and gentlemen, I have learned over the years not to fear truth. I have learned to love truth questions. You see, one of the things my parents taught me, and the reason for their non-sectarianism, was the basic biblical statement on which most of our human rights and law are based in the West. And that is the concept that human beings are of infinite value because they are made in the image of God. I believe that. And therefore, I take the arguments of people who do not share my worldview very seriously indeed. I have spent my entire life essentially examining what other people have to say. Why have I done that? Because for one, I do not wish to be fooled. And Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner for physics said, be careful. The easiest person to fool is yourself. And I always think of that. And therefore that keeps me calm. Secondly, I don't feel threatened by questions. Why? Because I can always say, I don't know. You see, I learned years ago that it's important to be honest. There are lots of things I don't know. People come to me often, they say, I'm an agnostic. I said, well, so am I. And then I add, and they say, what is it you don't know? Because there are things I don't know. Perhaps you can help me with what I don't know, and I can help me with what you don't know. Lots of things we don't know, and we can learn. But the final thing is I notice in the New Testament the way in which Jesus Christ treated people especially people who were hurting. He so impressed them that God was a God who loved them and had space for them and time for them. He could penetrate into their inner feelings and talk to them about issues that people today get very prickly about, like forgiveness. And yet we all need forgiveness, as we know. And therefore, when I do debates where people tell me to get angry, I just laugh at that. And I say, look, these people I'm debating with them, they have a serious point of view. I want to demonstrate that I take it seriously. And I believe that by bringing the notions into the public space, it gives people like yourselves a chance to judge. So I hope you listen to people who take a very different perspective from mine. That's what a university is about. Not keeping you safe from ideas, but introducing you to ideas. And finally, and most importantly, I've got a wife who would get mad if I got cross with anybody. There is one question uh, that um as an aroma of mathematics, do you think that uh, Gödel's incompleteness theory can be thought as a mathematical proof that science, as a formal system, is inherently limited? Yes. <laughs> Why I think that, that would take a long time. Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and uh, Many of you may not know anything about it, and I'm not going to bore you with it, but it's one of the most brilliant pieces of mathematical work ever done. 
And he showed that if you have a formal system that's strong enough to contain arithmetic, there are always true theorems that cannot be proved. And he also showed that such systems cannot prove their own completeness. So there's a, there is a real problem. And people like Sir Roger Penrose, who've worked on the brain, and there's been a lot of fascinating work. I'm not competent to judge it, but I read it. That Gödel's theorem, because it was thought up by the human mind, is one of the evidences that the human mind is more than a computer. That you will never reduce the human mind to what someone has called computing meat, M-E-A-T. There's more to it. And if you want to know any more about that, read Sir Roger Penrose, arguably one of the brightest mathematicians still alive. Thank you. Do you think good can be comprehended or approached through the heart or through reason? What about when the heart is deeply convinced, but the reason constantly works to deny what the heart says is true? Do you think that you can get married with the heart only without using reason? It's a confusion of ideas, actually. We use bits of the body like some of the ancients do, the heart, meaning predominantly the feelings, but it doesn't exclude reason. There's no either or. It's like saying, because a person is an empiricist, they don't reason about their experiments. Of course they do. Reason and empiricism are on a spectrum, and it's the same here. But I think I know what's behind the question. Let me put my answer this way. God, to me, is not a theory, but a person. And persons are infinitely more complex than theories. God is not a mere force. That's Star Wars. That isn't Christianity. The idea of God as a force is immensely dangerous because you being a person feel yourself to be superior to a force. We use forces, but that's not the God of the Bible. It's for him to use us, not us to use him as some kind of spiritual electricity or magic. So it's very important that it's both and. You know, I met a girl on day one at Cambridge. I started to talk to her. Could I listen to what she said without using my reason? Of course not. But could I see her beauty without using my reason? That's a more difficult philosophical question, isn't it? Because it's both and. You process all of these things. And so the question of approaching God, it's both and. God reveals himself in terms of a person and invites us to speak to him. And that's not a crazy idea. If there is a God who's personal and invented the universe, the idea, because he's created me as a speaking being and thinking being, that he might be prepared to communicate that's not an absurd idea, it's a totally consistent idea. Unless, of course, a priori, you reject the whole thing. So I want to argue for both and. And of course, emotionally, it is overwhelming. It can be when you look through a telescope, as I sometimes do, and see the Orion Nebula. It's wonderful. It's also emotionally overwhelming when you fall in love. But I do hope there's a bit of reason behind it all. Or you might find things fall apart very quickly. It's both and. There's a number of questions uh, which has uh, something in common. Maybe it's best summarized by one of them. I'll grant you a creator instead of atheism, but why Christianity? There are so many other options to believe in. Logical question. It's logical because the kind of argument that took up most of my talk inevitably gets you as far as, I would hope, a plausibility argument that there's a mind behind the universe. But then I stepped into a hugely different area when I 
towards the end, sighted, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now you'll notice that is not a claim of natural science. It is a claim, first of all, of history. And we beheld his glory. That is a claim of personal testimony. And if we want to move beyond, say, a deism, there's some kind of God behind the universe because I can see evidence for it in the mathematical describability of the universe and so on. Most of these pioneers of science were not just deists, they were Christian believers. Newton was a rather curious and complex quasi-exception to that. But nevertheless, how do you get there? Well, how did you make the first step? On the basis of evidence. I meant exactly what I said when I made the claim that Christianity is evidence-based. I know no other way to decide these things than on the basis of evidence. Now, what kind of evidence? Well, it clusters into two main kinds. There's what I would call the objective evidence. That is the evidence that's outside of me. The evidence of history, like the example I cited of the ancient historian, and there are others who will tell us basic facts of which we can be essentially sure because they're coming at it from a completely atheistic perspective. There is the evidence of the Gospels themselves, the hugely important evidence for the authenticity of the Christian documents. It's something most people haven't a clue about because they don't realize that if they did Latin at school, they often read and took for history books where the first evidence of them is nearly a thousand years after they were written, but only in a few manuscripts. I studied Caesar's Gallic Wars. I had no idea as a young person that there are documents for the New Testament. Some of them go back essentially poking into the second and the first century. And people say, but they've been copied out thousands of times. But that is to fail to understand. If I'm holding in my hand a piece of John's gospel dated in the first century, it goes back to the first century. How many times has it been copied? Perhaps once, not thousands of times through history. But you know, if that's a serious kind of question for you, you will look at the evidence. I find it very difficult to take people seriously who raise these questions, but don't look at the evidence. There's masses of it out there, and you can find it so easily by using the Google search engine. So history helps me enormously, because Christianity is not a mere philosophy. I, I nearly said anybody, if they're bright enough, or even if they aren't, they can invent a philosophy. But you cannot invent predictions that say you're going to be born 500 years before it happens. You cannot invent predictions that you're going to die and rise again and it happens. And what circles around for me, I notice, it's obvious historically, there would be no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus. That was the central message. And it was the central message because it was providing evidence that could be checked. Now, the book that has been fortuitously advertised tonight, Gunning for God, I have a whole section at the end of it on precisely these things. So if you would like to look at them in more detail, there's a lot on my website, which I should say is johnlennox.org. But in that book, Gunning for God, you will see me tackle the evidence, often through the eyes of atheist writers, for the authenticity of the New Testament. Now, why don't I belong to some other religion? Well, because I've examined evidence. I've got friends in most religions. I haven't looked at them all in the same kind of detail. Why is that? Because they don't all make the same level of claim. But they sometimes make claims that can be compared. 
For instance, my Jewish friends, and I've got many of those, believe that Jesus died, he did not rise. My Muslim friends, and I talk to them too, believe that he didn't die. I believe he died and rose. Now I think logic would tell you all three of those things cannot be simultaneously true. And so how do you deal with them? You look at the evidence. And you look at it historically. And you read, you do what Franz Kafka says. Have a look at this book. You may at last have read it when you were at school. You may never have read it as an adult. I would ask you to read it. But you say, is that enough? No, it's not enough. Because that kind of intellectual evidence gives you a plausibility structure for the next step. And the next step involves both the heart and the head. I used to constantly be accused of being very silly because I believed in Christianity as a scientist. Well, a mathematician anyway, kind of scientist. And they say, but look, in science, the basic criterion is testability. It's got to be testable. And Christianity is not testable. And I say, pardon? Who told you that? I wouldn't be a Christian. And I wouldn't be giving this lecture tonight if it wasn't testable. How can you test it? Well, you see... Suppose I make a philosophical claim. Well, it's a simple claim. There's a red Ferrari sitting 200 meters to the right of this building. And you can have a drive in it if you want. The keys are in the... Very unwise, probably, in this city. But there they are. The keys are in it. You can sit and argue philosophically with me all night, all tomorrow, all the next day. You'll never know whether that's true or not until you go and look. Isn't that right? You cannot work it out by pure reason, as Kant might have said. But you can work it out by practical reason. You can go and see. Now, Christ made certain astonishing claims. He claimed to be God in human form. God encoded in humanity. They called his name Jesus. And they tell us what it means, for he shall save his people from their sins. What on earth does that mean? Well, to make it more complex, but then all reality is complex, ladies and gentlemen. He claimed that his death and his resurrection would open up a way where people could receive a number of things. One of them is forgiveness. I think we all understand what forgiveness is. Another is peace. And I think there are many people in this room who'd love to have peace. They're restless. Restless because you haven't found a source of meaning that's big enough for you to expand into and live. But he says he will give us peace with God. But not only that, he says for people who will face the mess they've made of their own lives and of other people's lives, the Bible calls it sin. We don't like the word, but we know exactly what it means. He says that he will take upon himself that debt and free us up, not by our own efforts, but because of what he has done. You can test that. I have. I've seen hundreds of people do it. I, I wouldn't be here for a moment. I think immediately I say this, this place is a balcony. The last time I gave a big lecture at Harvard, and you can see it online, I finished. And up in the balcony, there was a Chinese student, and he stood up and he yelled in a loud voice. He said, look at me. And of course, we all did exactly what he said. <laughs> we all looked at him. And he was clearly addressing me. So I said, why should we look at you? He said, just look at me. And he was radiant with joy. And then he said, six months ago, 
I was at a different university where you were speaking. My life was in a complete mess. I couldn't see any way out of my problems. And he said, you said something that started me on a journey. And not long after that, I opened my heart and as a deliberate act of the will, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he said, just look at me now. It was the most powerful evidence. Now, that is one of the tests. Because you see, let me put it this way, very lovingly. You come from different viewpoints, different religions maybe, at different levels. One of the main reasons I'm a Christian, now I'm answering your question directly, is because these things that Christ offers me, I don't find them anywhere else. I don't find any other philosophy or religion that offers me peace with God known here on earth. I meet many philosophies and religions that tell me to follow this path and if I follow it, then someday if God is kind to me, he'll allow me into heaven. A bit like Prague University exams. You know the kind of thing? Do you? Even the professors of this university can't guarantee you a degree, can they? Even if they're very nice people like me, they can't. Because your degree depends on your merit, what you've achieved. And because almost everything in life depends on merit, people cannot get it out of their heads. And they think that God's like that. If I work hard, if I try to be good, then God might accept me. That's tragic, ladies and gentlemen. Shall I tell you why? Suppose all those years ago when I met the girl that became my wife and has been for 50 years, suppose I said to her, you know, I'd like you to be my wife. Well, that's a nice idea. But, you know, don't think I can accept you now. Absolutely not. So I hand her a lovely cookbook check cooking, you know? She said, what's this for? Well, I said, it's full of laws and rules for making nice check dumplings and things like that. No, I said, it's going to be like this. If you keep the rules in this book for the next 40 years, then I'll think about accepting you. Will you be my wife? Well, you can see what would happen. And we laugh. And yet many of you in this room think God's like that. And that's why you will have nothing to do with God. Because religion has made you sick. Because to your mind, religion is simply trying to accumulate a mass of merit in the desperate hope that you will be accepted one day. That is slavery, ladies and gentlemen. This message is totally different. This is a message of a God who loves you so much, he will accept you right now, tonight. Unconditionally. And that's the secret of my marriage, isn't it? Because I didn't give my wife a cookery book with those conditions. I did give her a cookery book. But I didn't make it the basis of a relationship. And because... Our relationship doesn't depend on merit points. It sets her free to cook, doesn't it? Out of love for me, not out of a desire to be accepted. So as you assess my final point in answer to this question, it's the most important question that's come tonight. Because there's such vast confusion in Europe, particularly about this matter. Ask yourself, a, a serious question. What message is it that is being preached to you by this religion or that religion? And compare them. And I've done so many times. And I come to the conclusion that Christianity doesn't compete with anything else. Because Christ offers me 
something that none of the others do and confess that they can't. So that's why I'm a Christian, sir. question. Uh, this answer actually answered uh, quite a number of questions that you sent. Uh, uh, why did God create us uh, full of questions and doubts? <laughs> to make life interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I haven't had that question in that form before, so thanks to the person who asked it. It's slightly skewed, of course. We don't have the same level of questions and doubts all the time. And the trouble is, in English at least, I can't speak for Czech, sadly, the word doubt tends to convey a black hole. I'm falling into doubt, I don't know where to turn and all this kind of thing. But dubitare in Latin simply means to be in two minds. And often, that is solved by simply getting more information. But it's a good thing to end with, because we're full of questions because we want to know. That's a very good thing. God doesn't just pre-program us with all knowledge. How boring that would be. Isn't it wonderful having to learn things? Well, Perhaps if you're doing your final exams tomorrow, you, you don't think that. But the learning process. Think of a child. I've got nine grandchildren. I don't know where they came from, but they came. And I, I watch these little ones. And what they know and what they learn. And Grandpa, what about this? And question after question after question. What a marvelous way of maturing rather than having it all pre-programmed and having an inbuilt Google on your ear and you just look it up and that's it. We need to learn and we need to mature by making decisions. And you see, from the Christian perspective, when a person receives Christ, that is, trusts him for their salvation, they get a new life that begins to grow. And of course, they're full of questions. And you see in the New Testament, Jesus was constantly asking questions and not always giving answers because he wanted to push people forwards. And you and I know that the things we really remember are answers that come to questions we've struggled with. It's part of life's process. And I find that encouraging because it means that the idea that God wants to repress humanity is false. That's an ancient lie that is recorded in the book of Genesis. God doesn't want to repress us at all. He wants us to grow up as his sons and daughters, learning, understanding, relating to him, being curious about all aspects of the world he created, and of course, principally, being interested in our relationship with him. Now, why God chose to do it that way? Well, how could I possibly answer that? But I can see sense in it just in watching it on the much smaller scale within my own family. Why do you have to spend years teaching a child when it could learn like that if it had a little machine built in to cope with it? Well, the day we reach that, we shall cease being humans. We shall be simply artifacts programmed to do what the computer says we should do. And that would be the end of the human race, of course. And that is also the end of our <laughs> lecture. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you, uh, Professor Nanox, and um, uh, we have a small gift for you, but we also have a small gift for all you who came. Uh, we have a small brochure for free as you walk out. You will pick, you can pick a copy. It is, uh, is in Czech. It's called Has Science Buried God? And it is a couple of interviews done by uh, two prominent Czech newspapers three years ago with John, uh, based on the talk that he gave uh, on this subject, Has Science Buried God? We also have a huge discount on um, Gunning for God, why the new atheism are missing, the uh, atheists are missing the target. We only have 50 copies. It is actually the last 50 copies that you can get because uh, they run out of stock worldwide. Uh, reprint is being arranged. Thank you very much. And uh, normally it's twice as uh, expensive. It is just for 200 crowns. Uh, and Anna will be uh, serving you uh, the books if you are interested. So thank you very much for coming. The lecture has been recorded and we very much hope that it will be online in a couple of weeks time. Good evening.